Good evening. I am Vallab Sambamurthy, Dean of the Wisconsin School of Business. And I thank each one of you for joining us this evening for what will be our final session of the Badger Executive Talks for this academic year. It's been almost a year ago that we started the Badger Executive Talk as a forum to bring the wealth of experiences and insights of uh, Badger alums who have uh, succeeded in leadership positions and to have them reflect about their journey and their insights, both about leadership as well as contemporary uh, business topics and challenges. And as you know, we've been living through some very interesting and challenging times, and uh, we've had some great speakers. It is fitting that uh, we end this year with uh, um, Tom Falk, one of the proud and accomplished uh, Badger alums from the Wisconsin School of Business. Tom recently retired as the executive chairman of the board of Kimberly Clark, which is home to some of the world's most recognized and trusted brands. Tom served as the chairman of the board and chief executive officer of the company for 16 years, and he was with the company for 36 years. He currently serves on the board of a few other companies and nonprofits. He is a member of the Federal Reserve Bank of uh, Dallas. Tom received his bachelor's degree in accounting from the University of Wisconsin. And um, his uh, wife is also a Badger alum. And I look forward to a conversation with Tom. So I'm sure that we will be seeing uh, Tom momentarily on our screen. Hey, here I am, Samba. Hi, hi, Tom. Good to see what you. A great intro. Some of it was true. <laughs> Welcome to Badger Executive, Tom. Thanks. Tom, what brought you to the University of Wisconsin and the School of Business? Yeah, well, uh, for me, it was a pretty easy choice. So uh, I'm the oldest of nine children, and uh, I earned a Caddy Scholarship, an Evans Scholarship. Uh, and in the state of Wisconsin, the only school you can go to as an Evans Scholar is University of Wisconsin. When, uh, when I got there, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to, to, to do or what I wanted to study. I thought I might want to go to law school at some point. And uh, I thought, well, I better major in something that I can get a job if I can't get into law school. And so I, I decided to, to try the School of Business. And I, I wish I could tell you I, I had the, that all figured out. Um, but I tell lots of college kids, you don't have to have it all figured out. You know, you should probably know what you might want to do next, uh, but you don't have to have the rest of your career figured out. And it worked out okay for me. I think it worked out more than okay. Uh, in my two years here, every time I met a Badger, they have some wonderful memories of uh, Madison and their time here, their favorite watering hole or corner. What are some of your memories from your time in Madison? Yeah, no, I, I have great memories of, of Madison. I, I was uh, dating my high school sweetheart who later became my wife and uh, and she also is a Badger. And so we had some great times uh, together uh, at University of Wisconsin. Home, homecoming was always a great uh, season. We used to do big floats. And so we were up to all hours of the night stuffing crepe paper through chicken wire to make these beautiful floats. And the, the engineers would make stuff go up and down. And it was, uh, it was fascinating. Uh, so that was... That was fantastic. Uh, we loved hockey games in those days. The, the football team wasn't very good. The basketball team wasn't very good. <laughs> we went to the football games, and then the hockey team was great. So we went to all the hockey games. And, uh, you know, that, my senior year was the year the U.S. Uh, Olympic hockey team uh, uh, won the gold medal. And so it was two oh. Badgers on it. So that was, uh, that was super exciting. Now, I have some, some less glorious memories, Samba, of walking down State Street in, in the end of January when it's 25 below zero and blowing like crazy. So yeah, I, I do have a few of those memories as well. I can relate to that. I arrived in uh, Minnesota in the thick of winter <laughs> and uh, in those cold days used to feel my nose to see if it was still there. So I can totally relate to those things. Yeah. And talking about 1980, the famous, do you believe in miracles? Uh, yeah. And I watched that movie so many times. No, I mean I, I can remember what I was sitting on the 
the couch in the basement of the Evans Scholar House watching the game, and everybody went crazy when the, when when we won. So, yeah, you know, um, leadership as a coach. I still remember. I watched the movie because I was, uh, and um, you remember the scene where they're all playing as individuals. And when he says, who do you play for? You Mr. Wisconsin. Yeah. And then one day they finally get it. And who do you play for? I play for the United States. I thought that was a very interesting lesson in coaching and the building yeah. of a team from a group of individuals. Well, not, not to burst the bubble, but we hated Herbie Brooks because uh, <laughs> I he know. was a Minnesota coach. And we I think we did something that insulted him and, so he did not like Badger fans, and he made some nasty comments about us. So whenever Minnesota played, all we did was chant Herbie all night long for, you know, just to try to annoy him. So we, we had to cheer for him within the Olympics, though. <laughs> That's an interesting story. I'll take it away for future reference. Started your career at Grand Thornton, but was were there for a short time, and you quickly transitioned to Kimberly Clark. Over your time and your journey and your growth in Kimberly Clark, are there some important milestones of your leadership journey, and uh, how did they shape your views about leadership? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I had a I had a great start at Grant Thornton. Uh, a guy named Elmer Lemon, who's a Badger alum, uh, offered me a, a job as an accountant. I needed to stay in Madison because my wife had to finish her degree; she was a year behind me in, uh, in age, and so. Uh, so I, I made my first career sacrifice to uh, adjust my career location to to uh, help my partner out, and uh, and that worked out great. And, uh, and Grant was a, a great experience, and I got uh, I got the opportunity to go join Kimberly Clark and turn a lot. And I, maybe the lesson was I didn't really like auditing that much, but I thought it was a great company and it was a great way to get in the door and and you know get into the financial organization and see how that would would work out. Um, I think the leadership or the lesson I learned was that I just tried to do as much as I could with every opportunity. And I was kind of ready with what I wanted to do next. Um, but usually somebody came along with a better idea. And so I was, uh, I was willing to move. Uh, I moved seven times geographically in the first 10 years I was with the company, um, which we, it's hard to make to ask people to do that these days. But in, in those yeah. days, uh, if you were willing to move, your career could move fast. I moved up, down, sideways, uh, uh, you know, and, uh, and and took lots of chances, which some people would have said, hey, you know, that might not be a great opportunity. But, you know, I had senior people asking me if I would go try it, and, uh, and I went for it. So, um, no, it, 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 it's been a wonderful uh, uh, company. I had lots of, lots of great people to work with over the years. How did you find the transition from uh, to the executive leadership, and were there um, – uh, things you had to adapt, grow, and learn? Or did you feel like your experience had already prepared you for the natural evolution into the CEO role? No, I mean, so my, my, my first p &L job um, was in, uh, in like 1993. I was running the, the U.S. diaper business, and it was uh, uh, P&G had just cut diaper prices by 10% and taken $200 million in profit out of the business. And I got interviewed by the Wall Street Journal the week before I actually officially had the job and was asked how I was going to turn it around and, uh, and, uh, and get the business back on track. And, you know, I didn't have a firm plan, but it was also, you had to be confident and believe in, in the team. And what, what I, I learned in that role was that, you know, I, I had every function reporting into me, you know, research, engineering, marketing, you know, finance, supply chain. And, you know, I knew a little bit about some of those, but I knew nothing about a lot of them. And, and so it forced you as a leader to figure out what, what do you bring to the role? You know, where are your strengths? Um, mm -hmm. Where do you have really strong people in other areas that you're not strong in and you need to rely on them? And then you need to pick one or two areas where maybe you need some change or you need something to happen that you can lean in on. And so for me at that point in time, it was, it was customer and sales organization. And you know, I said, so I don't know much about it, but I can learn. And so I went and spent, you know, a couple of days every quarter with our, our vice president of sales going out to see customers. I said, I'll go wherever you want to go. I'll carry your bag. I'll go <laughs> check store shelves. We'll go do headquarters calls, whatever you want to do. I, I just need to get a better understanding of how this works so that I can bring that back into my team and use it to help our team get even better in terms of how we take our 
great product ideas and our great marketing ideas and bring them to life in the, in the retail space. And so I think as, as you go into a new role, you've got to assess what do you bring to it? Where do you have real strength and where do you need to lean in and drive some change? Right. That's interesting because um, clearly you, on one hand, trusted the folks who are good at it, but by the same token, you were not afraid to lean in and learn something new and uh, um, uh, and signal that you are really uh, you're a fast learner. Well, there is no human being that is an expert in every yeah. functional discipline. Right. They just don't exist. There isn't the best research scientist who's also the best engineer, who's the best accountant, who's the best marketer, who's the best. You, you name it, that person doesn't exist. So the higher you go in an organization, you're gonna be managing functions that are outside your comfort zone. So you've gotta you know, make sure you can build a really strong team and know what questions to ask. Incidentally, Tom, there is a blast from your Grant Thornton past, Leslie Overton. Hello, yeah. Tom, voice from the beginning of your career at Grant Thornton. Yeah, Le Leslie used to work in the review department. So whenever I did an audit, Leslie would write me uh, comments about it. And uh, <laughs> then I think she went from there into the SEC and uh, and was actually in the enforcement division. So I spent the rest of my career trying to stay out of Leslie's. Uh, <laughs> Try to avoid anything that would attract yeah. Leslie's attention. <laughs> yeah. I heard you talk about your leadership style, about um, master of operational efficiency to the extent where your inbox was never uh, full. And I took that, uh, sorry, never empty, not full. <laughs> and- No, no, it was, it was always empty. <laughs> always empty. Yeah. That was your version of work-life balance. Don't take work home. Do you want to talk about how you evolved that and how did it hold you over time? Yeah. And so I, I, would, I wouldn't say, so people ask me a lot about work-life balance and I would say, there is no such thing as work-life balance, in my view. You are constantly fighting three forces in your life. The, the things you have to do for your job and your career is one set of activities. You have things you have to do for your family at a particular point in life. That might be spouse, children, you know, parents, siblings. At various points in your life, you'll have different needs and, and that are really important to, for you to be there and participate in those. And then the third bucket is yourself whatever you're doing for your own development, whether that's exercise or reading or continuous education or Bible study or whatever thing it is that makes you a better person. And those three forces are constantly fighting each other. And so what you have to do, I think, is, is try to recognize when you're out of balance and try to get back in balance at some point. If you're out of balance in any one of those for too long, you're not gonna be happy. And then you try to squeeze out the things that aren't those three things. So you know, I don't watch as much television as I used to. And you know, I would try to be home for dinner and spend time with my wife and son and participate in putting my son to bed. But then I might sit up and do all my pre-reads you know, for the next day to make sure I was ready and make sure my inbox was empty and I'd responded to everybody that I needed to be responding to. And so that when I started the next day, I was ready to go. Um, it helps to have a good assistant. So whenever I was going on an airplane ride, I always had a reading folder of all the stuff that I needed to get through before I got into the next uh, uh, thing. And, and then, you know, being good about planning your work and making sure you know what your key events are. And not like, not unlike in college, I knew when the papers were due and the projects were due. And I never pulled an all-nighter because I tried to make sure I had the work bucketed and got it done in the, in the right places. That sounds like a very good uh, leadership principle. Uh, based on your experience as a CEO of a global company, are there a couple of other leadership principles that uh, form the core of your uh, worldview that you would pass on to others? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I've told this story a number of times. There, the, the guy who gave me my first job, Elmer Lemon, my first day on the job, it was Alexander Grant in those days, Grant Fortin now. He uh, had us all in the conference room. There weren't that many of us that got hired. There were four or five of us that were starting that day. And, and he gave us his philosophy of business. He said, business is simple. He said, you need to do three things to be successful in any business. You, you need to deliver good service to your customers, you know, make great products, deliver great service, whatever it is you do, make sure you're making your customer happy. You need to find a way to grow. 
because uh, businesses that are going sideways or that are shrinking aren't any fun to work in. And you need to find a way to develop people. If you hire the people that are better than you are, they'll push you up the ladder. So don't be intimidated by that. You know, set that as your goal to go hire great people. And so as I reflect on my approach to business throughout my career, it's been those three things. It's been making sure that Kimberly Clark was delivering great products and delivering great customer service and, and doing that all over the world, making sure we were finding ways to grow and investing at the right level and the new products and the new businesses and the new markets so that we would continually be able to, uh, to create opportunities for our shareholders as well as for our employees. And then developing people. I mean, you know, the, the higher you go, the more it is about a pure talent game. When, when you start, it's about being the best doer and, and, and your, own, your own work product, but not, not very long after that. It's about motivating a team. And mm. you know, there's a limit to what any one person can do, but there's almost no limit to what a great team can get done. Right. You know, it's interesting as I was hearing you speak, um, what I found very heartening in the last 12 months, I remember last year in March, a sense of fear and dread about what will the the recession that was inevitable, the pullback with the pandemic due to the young graduates. And I was so heartened to see companies really doing their best to hang on to their talent, including our students who were graduating. Uh, and that was truly remarkable. I mean, um, uh, it must not have been easy. Is that what you have seen? Is that you see? Is you know, I, th I actually think that's the easiest decision to make. I see. Because the, the young talent is the future. It is the next generation. And, you know, if you ever stop, you're going to have a gap at some point. And, okay. and, and that is also where a lot of the work gets done in most organizations. Um, so the, the tougher decisions happen in the middle management ranks where you, you can realize in situations like we've just been through, you know, where, where were you? heavy on, on middle management or word, exactly. or can you get more efficient or get, get leaner? But um, I think it's a mistake to, to cut off your, uh, your, your hiring. You're much better off, you know, reorganizing how you do the work, but keeping the pipeline of new talent coming into the organization. Nice. Tom, we're also hearing a lot today about the expression, business should be a force for good. I sense that you were one of the earlier proponents by your actions of some of the things you did, particularly you talked about Kimberly Clark's commitment to sustainability. When you hear that expression, what does it mean to you? And what advice do you have to many of the young badgers listening in about embracing that as a value and as an aspiration? Yeah, well, I'd say, maybe I would say it in a slightly different way is that um, I think companies should have a meaningful purpose um, beyond making money for shareholders. You know, it should have a, a noble goal of what they're trying to do uh, in, in the world. And so Kimberly Clark, our, our goal was to lead the world at essentials for a better life. In other words, we want to be the best at making the things that mom needs to take care of her family. And that's a, that's a motivating purpose. And that, that, that made our team excited to come to work every day because they knew that stuff that we were doing was helping, whether that's in the pandemic when we were making as much bathroom tissue as we could possibly make because right. everybody wanted to buy it or whether that's in other markets where, you know, diapers are a new category and you're trying to make sure that moms have the things that they need to care for the most precious thing in their life, which is their, their infant child. Uh, so having a meaningful purpose is really important. Sustainability, interestingly, has taken on a lot of different meanings. When it started in the early days, it was just about uh, environmental responsibility, which was a good thing in and of itself. And so, you know, our first work in sustainability was around, you know, clean water usage and, and using less water per unit of output. It was around reducing energy uh, consumption per unit of output and starting to track that and set goals for it. It was around any kind of hazardous material releases and eliminating those or, or reducing them as much as possible. And then it was about uh, uh, getting all of our manufacturing facilities to be landfill free. So finding ways to reduce our waste or recycle our waste or find any way we could to get every one of our facilities. And I think Kimberly Clark today, it's 
98 or 99 percent of their facilities are landfill free so nothing comes out the back of the factory it all gets recycled and even the dust bricks that come out of our our air handling system they use to make soap or make cement or they they have some other life after uh, after it leaves our facility and they generate you know 40 or 50 million a year in revenue besides avoiding the landfill fees um, so so environmentalism was it was the start it's since grown to be measuring the broader social impact of a company. So it used to be, if you gave money to a charity, you'd score points on a sustainability report. Right. Now you have to show the impact that that gift had. And so, you know, over the years uh, at Kimberly Clark, we started things like, uh, like uh, toilets change lives. There's something like, I don't know, a billion and a half or two billion people in the world that have no access to a sanitary toilet facility. And so we realized that probably we weren't going to be able to recreate the infrastructure in the, in the developed world, but there was probably some entrepreneurial solutions. And so we, we brought a little bit of money, some R&D technology, we partnered with some other companies, and we were trying all kinds of different models in, in India and in parts of Latin America to provide communities that had no sanitary toilet facilities, which causes it's a leading cause of infant mortality. Okay. So you get you get dysentery from the bad water supply and the babies get sick. Uh, it actually is a leading reason why girls stop going to school um, because if there's no sanitary toilet in their school, when they reach the age of puberty, there's no, no safe place to change their pad, they quit going to school. Um, and so it has a huge impact on life in these communities. So that, so that would be one. Uh, we started to work on a project called Malaria No More um, with a couple of other NGOs in, in East Africa, because in that part of Africa, malaria is the number one killer of children under age five. And so we we felt like, you know, we've, we've gotten rid of the malaria in most of this hemisphere, but we have not in other parts of the world. And so we brought a process of education as well as some simple tools, basically nets that would go over infant cribs at night that would protect them from the mosquitoes and keep the babies from getting uh, from getting sick and had a huge impact on, on on human life. So there's things like that that the company has started to try to measure the impact on human life and try to scale it by partnering with other NGOs and you know we partner with with things like the Gates Foundation and others that are trying to have a bigger impact and then and then try to measure it. Okay, it's interesting. Um, that comes us to also the question of uh, running a global company. So, and I'm going to connect the two. Um, so we hear a lot about everybody today should have a global mindset. And uh, during our conversations, you've talked about uh, India, uh, China, Korea, and so on. How easy is it or difficult is it to truly have a global mindset? And what does a global mindset mean? It's tough. Um, and because everybody tends to think that their ideas are the best ideas in their market. <laughs> and everyone thinks that they know their consumer best. And nobody wants to be told by the North Americans or by the Europeans or by whoever the bosses are that, well, this is the new global program and you have to go roll that out. Um, and so the trick is to figure out how to make good ideas which can pop up anywhere travel fast and how to make decisions based on facts and common test, testing and common research. And, you know, we had a famous story that we make a lot of different kinds of facial tissue boxes. Um, you know, literally thousands and thousands of different facial tissue boxes all over the world get, get produced in the, you know, we have all different kinds of marketing teams that do research and, well, yeah, and, and we share the best designs and most countries will pick one that somebody else used and not have to reinvent it. They can just take it and run with it. Well, Australia had, in the whole history of our facial tissue business in Australia, had never used a package graphic that had ever originated outside of Australia. And so I was over there, and they were very proudly sharing this. And I'm like, seriously? I mean, like, <laughs> you know, tens of thousands, and not not one. <laughs> and and you know, because it was, they sort of set it up that if it wasn't invented here, it couldn't possibly be good enough. And so. We've been working really hard on changing that while still providing people with the ability to experiment and try new things. And, and so the, the role of the global teams is more to not to tell people what to do, 
but to surface good ideas and get good ideas to travel fast. And then we've tried to reward people for, for swiping an idea from somewhere else and launching it in their market. And so we start, you know, and it doesn't have to be a financial reward. It can just be recognition and start to, you know, highlight all the, the, the great swiping uh, activities that have taken place where, and you don't have to do very much of that before people start to realize, all right, that's what, that's what they want. That's what's getting rewarded. And you start to get curious about what's happening in other places. And, uh, um, and the, the great news is we have, outstanding people in many, many markets around the world, and they're doing great stuff. The trick is how do you get those good ideas to bubble up and travel faster? Nice. So quite in the spirit of our conversation, Tom, here's a question from one of my colleagues, Russ Koff, the proud holder of the Tom Falk Distinguished Chair in Business. So yeah. hey, Russ, <laughs> his question is, Tom, in the spirit of the Business Roundtable's recommendations, can you describe a hard decision where you navigated trade-offs between shareholders and other stakeholders in the spirit of sustainability? Maybe where you caught some flack. Uh, you know, it's 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 interesting. I mean, when the BRT made that statement, uh, my successor is on the BRT now. I, I said, so uh, did did you call him up and tell him that we've been running Kimberly Clark that way for the last 150 years, and that it's finally <laughs> it's great that they finally woke up and figured that out. And so, uh, and and so there are there are examples every single day where you're making trade-offs. And I used to to tell people would ask me the question all the time. And so, so Tom, what keeps you up at night? And uh, <laughs> and and I would say I sleep like a baby. You know, <laughs> uh, I wake up every three hours and cry. Um, but no, seriously, I would say that when I wake up in the morning, I think about two groups of people. I would think about the, the investors that had $45 billion invested in Kimberly Clark stock that wanted to return on it today. And I would think about the 45,000 Kimberly Clark employees and their nice. families that were counting on me to make good decisions and the communities that they lived in that were affected by that. And neither one of those groups should always win every argument. And, uh, um, some, uh, and so in most cases, their interests are aligned. The company is growing and more profitable and doing great. Everybody wins. There's more opportunity for employees. Investors are making money. But there are times where, where it, it doesn't work out. And so we've, I've done a lot of restructuring. Uh, you know, there, there's ways you could do it that I could have saved money and it would have been harder on employees. And I think it would have been detrimental to our culture, but would have been slightly better for shareholders in the short term but I wasn't going to do it that way. I, I mean, it was hard enough to do it the, the way that we did do it, but I would try to do it in a way that, that, you know, preserved uh, the, the culture and, and treated employees fairly in the process. I mean, things okay. like uh, we, we use the same workplace safety definition. We use the same environmental standards all over the world, no matter what the local regulatory authority required. So right. you know, in, in Thailand, we had secondary effluent treatment on our tissue mills 40 years ago. And even though they only ever required primary effluent treatment. And I could say, well, if I was maximizing shareholder return, I would have only paid for the lowest standard that was required by local law. But I didn't think that was the right thing to do. And my predecessors didn't either. I mean, that was, it wasn't that I just started running the company that way. It, it has always been run that way, where you're trying to do the right thing uh, every day. I mean, even things like um, sustainability, uh, uh, we started the uh, 150, we celebrated 150 years as a company next year, by the way, but 150 mm. years ago, we started as a newsprint company and we were cutting down trees to make newsprint. And 150 years ago, they figured out if we cut down one tree, we should plant two more. Nice. So we will never run out of trees. Well, that, that there was no government regulation. There was no sustainability report. There was no one making you do it. It would have been cheaper to not replant in the short term. Eventually, you would have gone out of business. But you know, I, I think companies, good companies, are constantly balancing uh, the the shareholder requirements, uh, what's what's right for their workforce and those communities, what the other stakeholders that are involved. Uh, and I, I do think sometimes the business press tends to view this as an all or nothing. Right. You know, it's always all all for the shareholder or it's always all for the stakeholders and the community and the employees. And the, the reality is neither one should win every argument and good management teams figure out how to balance those things over time to keep all of their stakeholders 
reasonably happy, but they're never going to make everybody happy all the time. Nice. It's interesting. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the themes today. We're hearing so much about uh, uh, importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know that uh, during your leadership at Kimberly Clark, you were noted for your commitment to diversity, particularly how you nurtured uh, gender diversity. What's your view on why should diversity, equity, and inclusion be in the DNA of any business? And then what advice do you have for nurturing those aspirations? Yeah, no, well, I'm, I am passionate about this subject. And so, um, and I think it gets mischaracterized. I think oftentimes when we start talking about diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion, it's a it's an equity or a fairness argument where maybe some group has been unfairly treated and we're going to try to treat them fairer. I actually believe diversity is about making sure you're getting your fair share of the best talent wherever it lives. Um, and so I, I, I'll, I'll steal an analogy from Malcolm Gladwell, who is a, an author that I really like to read. And M Malcolm uses an example of if somebody, if you and I picked 100 people out of the group that's watching this conference call, and we're each going to pick an all-star team of 10 people out of that 100. And you get to pick your 10 people out of the whole 100. And I only get to pick my 10 people out of the 50 people on the right-hand side of the room. Who would have a better team? Well, you yep. would. You're picking out of the whole 100. And you know, if you think about it, if you're going to run a company that's composed of a white male workforce, that's maybe 30% of your available workforce. I think you'd have a hard time convincing me that you have – the, you might have gotten the very best white males that are out there, but I suspect you are missing a huge potential talent pool for your, your company. So, so diversity, you, if you are diverse, you've got to be wondering, do I have the best talent? I mean, because I must not be getting my fair share out of all the other pools that everybody else is getting great people out of. And then inclusion is about how do you get those great people to come to work every day and feel like, their ideas are going to get traction. That they they're they're they've got an equal shot with everybody else. You know, versus if I, if if you walk in the door and you feel like you get about an eighty percent shot, and somebody else shows up that, and they think maybe I only got a twenty to thirty percent shot, that's that's not good. And right. I talk to our team leaders all the time, and I'd say I bet every one of you has got one or two people on your team that they are your go-to person. Yeah. You know? You love them. They love you. They can finish your sentences. You give them stuff. They go do great things with it. I said, guess what? Everyone on the team knows that they're your favorite. I said, I bet you've also got one or two people that, eh, you know, they're not your favorite. In fact, if you have to meet with them, you schedule them when you've got a hard stop because you've got no <laughs> team to go to and you want to make sure they're out of your office. And I said, guess what? Everybody knows that those are not your favorite people. The whole team always knows. They figure this out. And I said, so guess what? It's not their fault. It's your fault. Yeah. You're the yeah. leader. You created that belief. So what do you need to do to get more? And get, if either if the people that aren't your favorite aren't any good, then you should get rid of them. Get somebody else. Yeah. If it's that you're not leading them in the right way and you're not, you know, giving them the, the direction, the, the coaching and adapting your style to get the best out of them. I, I'll use the analogy of, of coaching and said, you know, how many of you have been on a great team, an athletic team? And did the coach coach every player exactly the same way? Right. No. Or, and if, how many of you have got siblings or multiple children? You know, do you parent every yeah. child exactly the same way? No, of course not. You try to adapt your style. Well, I think sometimes as leaders, we think, well, this is the way I do it. Instead of saying, you know, I've got to flex and adapt my style to get the best out of every individual on the team. And that's what inclusion is, is that if we can all come through the door, maybe I can't get everybody to think they're going to get 100%, but maybe I can get everybody to 80% most of the time. That's pretty good. You're going to have a pretty, you know, and then maybe one week they think they're the favorite, and the next week somebody else is the favorite, and the next week somebody else is the favorite. That's fine. I'm fine with that as long as it's not, you know, one guy. And it's, like it's small things. I mean, I had a team leader. He ate lunch with the same person on our team every single day. <laughs> Guess what? Everybody knew who the favorite was. Didn't have to tell them. <laughs> you know? right. So find those small and, and, and sometimes not so small ways of making sure that everyone on your team feels like 
they, they can make a difference and they can have an impact. So that's, that's my long story. story on diversity and inclusion. I think we tend to make it a special project. Yeah, It's got to be just about how you lead every day, how you get people. You got to make sure you got diverse slates. So you're, you're mining all the possible talent pools. You've, you know, inclusion, you've, you've got to make sure you're getting, you're, getting the right feedback on your own leadership style and you're cascading that down into your organization so that everybody's feeling it that way. Okay. That's interesting. I mean, that's why we've been aspiring to say it should be the DNA of the place. And I guess the best measure is when you are not talking about it, but obviously we're far away from there. Why do you think, uh, uh, first of all, are companies uh, still having a struggling, challenging with uh, achieving uh, the kind of mindset that you described? And it's so why do you think that is? Well, I think I think global companies have an advantage in some ways, and so you know, if I would and and you know, for a long time, diversity and inclusion was viewed as kind of a U.S. affirmative action issue, and when we right. opened it up twenty years ago to be a global issue, I mean, it said, hey, you know, this is the same issue on on women in the workforce in Latin America. I mean, half the workforce in Latin America is female, and if you don't have if your leadership team is all male. How can you argue you've got the best team? Yeah. Um, you know, and, and Asia is the same way. And Asia is very different based on in places like in the former or currently uh, uh, communist countries like China and Vietnam. Actually, we do great on women and in, in workforce because they were all equal and they are educated the same way. In places like Korea and Japan, which were uh, you know, democracies or, or, or other uh, forms of government, uh, women tend to not have done as well in society. And so they're a little bit behind, but we're, we're working on, uh, on, on all of those areas and trying to get our leaders everywhere to be thinking about how do you get the, your fair share of the best talent? And un unless you're a little bit uncomfortable with that, um, you're, you're not going to get the same change. If it's just a, a fairness or an equity issue that you, you work on in, in your spare time, it'll, it'll, you'll make a little bit of progress. But if you're dissatisfied or you're worried you don't have your fair share of the best people, yeah. everybody knows that's what really makes a difference in business. And you're, you're going to put it on the front burner. Interesting. We're beginning to see the questions beginning to heat up, Tom. Before we go there, I wanted to ask you another question because I've heard you talk about this in a fascinating way, which is the following. You know, we all know that uh, part of developing yourself as a leader is to uh, professionally network and uh, that the network is your capital. How did you develop your professional networks? And then at, I'm sure at some point you became the center of others professional networks. What advice do you have to pass on about the value and approach toward professional networking, particularly to advance and flourish in your career? Yeah, I, I would get asked this question a lot. And I, and I think in my reflection in most companies, um, there are two types of, uh, of, of networks. There are mentors who are people that probably are senior to you, maybe in the same function, the same business that can kind of help you understand and interpret what's happening around you. So if you got put in a particular project or you got a new boss or you've got some new team members or you got a new project that's, that's new to you, how might you interpret that and what, what, what tips for success might you get to help you be more effective? And so mentors can be really helpful in, in helping you kind of wind your way through particularly bigger or more complex companies. Sponsors, on the other hand, find you. And so sponsors, uh, their job is to open doors for you or to pick mm -hmm. you up and move you forward into, uh, into an opportunity. And, uh, and so, you know, both are good. I think sometimes employees can get confused and think that mentors are the ones that are going to move them forward and they might, they might become a sponsor but they might not be in the best position to be a sponsor. Um, and sometimes you might not even know you're being sponsored. But, right. but I think in great companies, um, it's the job of every leader to sponsor the next generation. And so uh, I, I would routinely talk with all of our leaders about you know, the list of people that, that, the, that they were sponsoring, that they were personally involved and knew what their career development plans were and were helping open doors or move them into the positions that they needed so that they'd be ready for the opportunities that we thought they, they were capable of, uh, of, of getting to. And I did a very powerful exercise um, 
once with our, I had our top 150 leaders together and I said, uh, I want you to write down a little three by five white index cards. This is a very analog uh, exercise. Uh, um, the names of the people that, that sponsored you that are the reason you are sitting here today. And, and then we're going to put those all up on a board and, uh, and they're going to be in the room here with us. And they're going to be really proud that you're sitting here today as an officer of the company and, You've, your career has, has taken it to this level. And there were some of us in the room whose names were on those cards. Mm. And, and there was never a more proud moment that someone right. felt like you did something that opened a door or unlocked an opportunity for them. And, and then I asked him at the end, another exercise, I said, who would write down your name today? Who are the people that you are paying it forward to? And, right. and and great companies realize how important this is and that, you know, every one of us, and I think every executive you would talk to would say, you know, at some point in my career, or maybe several points in my career, somebody took a chance on me okay. and gave me a shot and gave me an opportunity. I wasn't maybe fully qualified or there were several good candidates. And for some reason, they picked me. And, you know, and those you, you need to remember those people because those are your sponsors and they you know, if you continue to perform, they will make a difference for you. I really liked when you described it uh, uh, because it brings up uh, forward leaders as sponsors as an implicit uh, responsibility and value. Right? You talked earlier about the biggest thing impact we can make is leaving behind the next generation of leaders. We talk so much about the power of mentorship, but the flip side of that, the role of sponsors, that's a very powerful idea. Yeah. I mean, leader's job is not to climb up the ladder and then pull a ladder up after them. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. I mean, going back to my very first story about, you know, you know, deliver great service, find a way to grow and develop people. You know, the, the, the corollary is great, hire great people, hire people that are smarter than you are. They'll make you famous. You know, and they'll push you up the ladder. It's that classic line, everybody you meet on your way up, you meet them on your way down. So hopefully yeah. they remember you as sponsors and mentors. Yeah. <laughs> There's a question from Jackson Alexander, Tom. Um, and you might have already answered part of it, but still. Jackson's voice... father works for Kimberly Clark and is, uh, is the head of investor relations. So uh, it's very nice of him to ask a question. He's a proud Wisconsin <laughs> alum. Very good, Jackson. Glad that you're listening in tonight. And uh, so, Tom, what advice do you have for young professionals to help them advance their careers? The next CEO of Kimberly Clark. <laughs> no, I, I think um, do the very best job that you, that, that you can and what your current responsibilities are, um, and then be open to new opportunities. I mean, I, you don't have to have it all figured out. I, I tell our young people, I said, you're, you're the CEO of your own career. And so CEOs have to do three things. They got to deliver results. You know, they got to have a plan. You don't have to have, a, have to have a plan for the next 30 years. You should know like the next three or four years, maybe what you want to do next or what the, the pathway is. And then they build capability in their organization. So if you're CEO of your own career, what are you doing to build your own capability? Uh, and that can be formal education. That can be informal education. Um, I, I would, would talk to our young people that were interested about it and going into another function and say, you know, this is in the days when we were in offices and where people had lunch, I'd say, well, go ask someone in that function to have lunch with you. It doesn't co cost anything to have lunch and find out what they're working on and find out, you know, ask a bunch of questions. See if you can go job shadow somebody for a day. And so invest in con continually upgrading your own skills. Be curious about the business that you're in uh, and then see what happens. That's powerful. You know, in fact, I've often had similar conversation to tell folks that never be shy or embarrassed about being the CEO of your own career, seek out new experiences and don't yeah. confuse that with uh, disloyalty. So that's interesting. And sometimes I see young people and they, they like have the whole next 30 years figured out. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, it just doesn't work out that way very often. I, I think most people that you would interview would say, I never thought I'd be doing this when I was getting out of college, and yeah. I certainly didn't. Um, yeah. And and you know, if you're curious and you're open to to new things, you, you'd be just amazed what a rewarding career you can have over time. Absolutely. 
So here's a question from Luciano Oviedo. Uh, hopefully I got the name right. Uh, he is actually building up on an earlier question from Russ Koff. And he wants to know is, um, to what extent does strategy formulation comprehend the social impact of decisions? Are there tools, processes, any things that you uh, uh, implemented in your time at Kimberly Clark? Yeah, no, no, I think that, that there are there are certain explicit strategies that, that we would do. So every one of our, our uh, production facilities had a five-year energy plan. Uh, they had a five-year environmental management plan. Uh, every one of our overall businesses had a sustainability plan, whether that was building more sustainable materials into their products and their innovation work streams, uh, whether that be working on bigger energy ideas. And so, uh, so th there's a series of, of explicit uh, uh, environmental strategies that, went, that, that they were working on. And then as we've gotten more into the social impact side, it's, it's how do you link our brands with the right causes that both do good in, on, on the, in terms of improving impact on human life and also resonate with the consumer and make them like your brand better. And so nice. if you can do that, it's, it's a win-win. You know, and our Huggies business in the U.S. Um, does a ton of work with local diaper banks. And, uh, uh, and basically, you know, we'll, we'll run sometimes promotions where if you buy a package of Huggies, we'll make a donation of X many diapers. And over the years, you would give away millions of diapers to local diaper banks, which help uh, low-income moms uh, uh, get, get uh, the things that they need to care for their family. And our teams feel good about it. Our customers feel good about it. Our consumers that bought the product feels good about it, and and you know it's the right thing to do, and it uh, uh, it builds your business over time. Wonderful. There's a question from Paul Son. <laughs> Tom, how much of your success came from hard work and talent? How much from luck? You know, uh, that's a good question. So the the way I would tell you that story is that Kimberly Clark offered me a job a year before I accepted. And uh, I wasn't quite ready to change careers yet. Um, I, in Wisconsin, I'd only been out of school for two years. You had to work three years to get your CPA certificate. So I, I wanted to work one more year and get the CPA certificate. So I passed the exam and I wanted to, the, I never actually ever did sign my name CPA, but I wanted the, <laughs> the uh, ability to do it for some reason at that point in my career. So I turned them down. Uh, they came back a year later and offered me a job again. And so I, I wonder, what my career path would have been had I said yes the first time. Yeah. And so there, there is an element of being in the right place at the right time, you know, when there's a big project or a big opportunity and you happen to be there and you get the, the chance to shine. Um, and then it's doing something about it. And so I think the, the maybe the best way I could, could describe it is I don't know who, who somebody famous said this once, but the, the harder I work, the luckier I get. So, uh, so the, the more good things you do, the more opportunities yeah. you're, may, may come your way and, and you'll have a, a chance to, to, to do that. But, but definitely luck plays a role in, uh, in every career. And, right. uh, and, you know, and I think people have to be mature enough to recognize, okay, that was, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. You know? Perhaps the harder you worked, more sponsors had you on their dance card. And uh, yeah. so that maximized your luck. Yeah. Great. Another question. This is from Thomas Maney, and hopefully I got your name right, Thomas. Uh, hi, Tom. What are some of the trends or changes that you see in the CPG industry having to adapt over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, I mean, digital and data. Yeah. So um, digital marketing uh, and, and data and more and more data and understanding of the consumer. And so um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure many of the listeners know this, but you know, when, when you uh, are opening a browser and you see ads pop up, I mean, I don't know, Kimberly Clark runs 60 or 70 little auctions uh, and auction right. sites all over the world that are bidding on the right to pop that ad into your browser. And when they make the bid, they know who you are, what your value is, what your family size is, what your purchase patterns are, whether you're a brand loyalist for us or for, for our competition, and how much is it worth to to pop that ad in your browser. And then we can measure whether you buy the product and, and, uh, and just get better and better and better at it. You know, we used to make 30 second TV commercials 
Now we make TV commercials in six second bursts. Right. And when you open the browser, we assemble the pieces into the message that's relevant to you. Um, so, so companies are, the, the more data we get and, and, and are able to micro target. And there's limits on in each country as to what you can do. And we don't, we don't like know your social security number or your credit card number, but we know you're you across all your platforms. It's interesting you're talking about digital marketing, Tom. This is the week of the FANG company earnings. So Google yeah. yesterday, blowout quarter, talked about the explosive growth in digital ads. Today, Apple, Facebook. So, and then of course, uh, you and I talked previously the Apple's new feature and how that may cause a flutter in limiting uh, the ability to uh, increase privacy. So it's a, it's a yeah, brave. Well, I, I think there's going to be a war over our data. And right now, consumers yeah. are pretty much willing to give it up for free because yeah. we like the benefits of all the technology. Um, you know, I, I think th th there will, there, there's a lot yet to be figured out globally about exactly how that, uh, who owns it, who can do what with it. Um, but, yeah. but I think it's a, it's a powerful force. It is. Other than Kimberly Clark, which CPG companies uh, do you pay attention to that they are doing, getting it right in this digital economy? I mean, we would, we would watch uh, Procter and Gamble a lot. Um, yeah. You know, we, we, we also look at some of the Asian companies, some of the, the Chinese uh, uh, companies are, are doing some pretty interesting things. Uh, uh, both uh, on the uh, on the e-commerce and, and other uh, providers, you know, just you know, looking at Jingdao and, and Tencent and some of the, yeah. the players there, just not even necessarily competitors in our space, okay. but just companies that are doing some really interesting work in that space. Wonderful. Tom, by the way, Thomas Meany is one of our incoming Kimberly Clark interns for this summer about to start his uh, <laughs> journey at Kimberly Clark. And this is from Betsy, his proud career coach. Yeah, well, every uh, every summer I used to go and give a speech to the uh, the co-op and intern students because uh, uh, they were a lot of fun. Uh, they asked the best questions because yeah. uh, they're very curious about the company and they were unafraid because you know, they didn't work for us yet. So they, they would ask me <laughs> any kind of question. And, uh, yeah. uh, and so, uh, that was one of the most fun uh, fun speaking engagements I had every year. I can't wait for us to return to campus in September because the fun job in my role, just like what you described, is meeting these uh, freshmen coming in. I and agree. Yeah, no, campus is so much fun when there's students on it. Isn't <laughs> when, it? When there's not, it's a pretty boring place. I think. Oh, it is. Yeah. And I enjoy their irreverence because that's so refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> so, no, they're they're, uh, they're smart, uh, smart young people, that's for sure. Indeed, indeed. That's the fun job that I also have <laughs> of being among young people. So here's a question from Anthony Abram. Um, the, by the way, before I ask the question, um, uh, Tom, the accolades for Thomas Meany keep rolling in. He's also the president of the full-time MBA Graduate Business Association. So it looks like Kimberly Clark has made the right choice. <laughs> well, good, our, our recruiting team is is, uh, is on the case. That's great. <laughs> the phones are ringing. So here's a question from Anthony Abraham. Uh, Tom, given the changes in the climate for multinational businesses that they operate in, globalization, e-commerce, if you look backward, what opportunities and skills do you wish you had an earlier exposure to? Yeah, I mean, I, I never lived or worked outside the US. And so that would have been a fantastic uh, development experience. I traveled a lot. There, there was a couple of years, I think I made 10 trips to Europe where my wife thought I actually lived in Europe, but uh, <laughs> uh, I, I uh, I, you know, I think that would have been, uh, and it's, it's difficult to do. It's something that not everybody can do. And, and these days in a COVID world, I mean, I don't know how we're going to do that going forward, but, uh, but, you know, having a chance to spend a more significant amount of time in a, in an international market would have been a, would have been a great development experience. Tom, um, you are a voracious reader. In fact, talking to you, I've been inspired to go back to doing something I used to do very well, read more. 
So what are you reading recently and what would you recommend? Yeah, no, I've read a bunch of books. I read a book called Kill Switch, which is a kind of the history of the filibuster. I'm on a, I'm on a couple of public policy boards and I wanted to learn more about how that worked. So uh, that was interesting. I'd recommend that one. Uh, I've got the Code Breakers I'm about to start, which is uh, Walter Isaacson, uh, who I read everything that Walter Isaacson has ever written. And that's about uh, the people that did the initial genetic sequencing, which has led right. to a lot of the, the technologies that we're now benefiting from in vaccines and other things. Um, I don't read much science fiction. I read a couple of books by a Chinese author uh, that were science fiction that were that were very thought provoking. I still think about them every once in a while. One, the, one was called The Three Body Problem and the other one was called The Dark Forest. They're by an author named Xi Xin Lu and they're, uh, they're translated back into English. Hmm. Uh, what else? I read a book called First Principles recently, which was uh, the education that our founding fathers received and what they were educated by and how did that influence, you know, uh, Alexander Hamilton, Hamilton and, and James Madison and others who wrote our constitution and, yeah. uh, and, and their, the forms of government that they selected and why that might have been. So, uh, yeah. so those are a few of them. Very fascinating. You know, Code Breakers, I should check it out. I'm so impressed and excited about this uh, mRNA. Yeah. Because not only is it uh, about COVID, but uh, such a promising technological breakthrough for cancer and other medicines. So yeah, one of one of my good friends um, is Ian Reed, who was a CEO of Pfizer for many years, and Ian was on the ah. Kimberly Clark board, and he retired about the same time I did, and uh, uh, and he did the initial investment with the firm that that uh, developed the vaccine. They were trying to find uh, uh, a flu vaccine that really worked. Um, and, you know, obviously it, it's fortuitous that it, it's yeah. going to work on a, another really important coronavirus. Interesting. So, Tom, talking about reading, there has to be a future book written by Tom Falk on leadership. What's the title of that book? You know, I, I'm not very good at this. And I, I always <laughs> believe that uh, uh, I've read a bunch of CEOs books. Uh, I didn't think any of them were very good. Uh, usually <laughs> in the book, the CEO uh, immortalizes for all time that it took them longer to figure stuff out than everybody else did. So uh, uh, um, I, I, I would uh, I'd probably say uh, uh, I, I, I did it with great people. You know, that, I, that, uh, <laughs> there's, a, there's very little any of us does on our own, but if you've got a great team, you can, uh, you can get just about anything done. So if I can offer you a suggestion, simply an exclamation mark as the title. <laughs> This is the definitive book on leadership. Tom, it's been so wonderful. The time seems to have passed so fast and really enjoyed. And I know that uh, our listeners out there have uh, benefited a lot and uh, looks like uh, it's been a close family uh, with the number of questions we've got. So thank you very much for taking time with us this evening. And of course, you know, football is back on. And so... Yeah. I look forward to seeing you in Madison and um, here's to another winning season. You can watch hockey too, but we win football now, right? What Absolutely. Else? On Wisconsin. On Wisconsin. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks, Tom. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. So this concludes our evening with uh, Tom Falk and what a delightful conversation it was. And you can see what an illustrious career he has had, but more importantly, how much of a true badger he is in terms of his willingness to give back in his passion and pride in the University of Wisconsin. And I've met many such badgers during my two years here. As I said before, this is our last uh, session of Badger Executive Talk for this year. We will resume again in fall. And we have a equally good lineup getting organized. So thank you very much for joining us, for supporting us and on Wisconsin.